Welcome to the UpstreamLife.com, a podcast that focuses on business transformation. Today, I have with me Anirudh Mani, the founder of Artha Venture Fund. It has exited Oyo, Purple, Exotel, and many other companies. But who is Anirudh Mani beyond the exit? So I'm here to find that out for you. And by the way, he's a very good, uh, good friend of mine. I can tell you that. I, we've, uh, we've done many things in San Francisco, and he introduced me to Sushi, and I thank him for that. Right? Anirudh, uh, Anirudh how are you? I'm good. How about yourself? Which I'm other? very good. It's always excited to exciting. Sorry, it's always exciting to have you back and uh, you know talk about uh, business and transformation. But today, I want to talk about who Anirudh Dhamani is. Right? I know you as a friend, but I don't know about your childhood. You come from a business family. Uh, your uncle and dad had a, a stockbroking business. It all began there. I want to flesh that out because most of us think about transformation as something that you can read in books and transform, but that. Does not happen that way. You written a very nice column last year talking about how you learned your chops in the eighties and went on to build a large business as you've done today. You want to talk about those early days with your dad and uncle watching them and what did you learn? And some of them were hard, harsh, and some of them were good. So yeah, I think it was uh, you know so to so to clarify actually uh, it's a fourth generation entrepreneurial family right so great grandfather is the one who really started the business thing uh, the company he formed i believe is still operating today but one of the, uh, the other family trees has taken it uh, <clears throat> my my father and uh, uncle actually were forced into business uh, because my grandfather died at a very very young age he died like two months before i was born uh it was a very sudden thing and you my uh, my father i think at that time was uh, something like 21 years old or 24 years old or something like that and uh, so so you know and and my grandfather had uh, seven kids right so and five daughters out of that so suddenly all the responsibility fell on my father and my uncle to make sure you know the, the family uh, not only had enough to survive and had business but also to, to get all these daughters married and obviously get themselves settled in life and i think all of that <clears throat> the good thing was that since i was born only a couple of months later i got to see the struggle at a very early age right i i mean i i wore hand me downs from uh, you know by uh, uh, from family members i uh, i remember that uh, you know we we had bought i think at one point a car and that i loved a lot and, and it was about 800 the old one you know the, the the one the not not the, the newer 800 which came out in the late 80s but the the one that we used first to be there earlier, the first generation, first generation, exactly. And I remember that one, and then suddenly one day it was gone, and, I, and then I I realized years later that there was a loss, and then we had to you know obviously sell the car. So saw all of that, and I think uh, towards the end of the eighties is when the business side is really getting uh, established. Uh, my father's uh, stockbroking arm started taking off. My uncle, uh, you know, decided to also join from the bullion side into the stockbroking side, and then both of them together really got the business uh, skyrocketing. I think the 90s was a great time uh, post the 1991 you know dream uh, you know the opening of the economy uh, and, and you know through all of it I you know in many ways these are these are pre computer days right I I have seen uh, you know uh, my uncle and 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 my father sitting and, and sign you know they, they you had to sign those share transfer forms and you know obviously did so many trades and there was like a gazillion signs to do and and i used to see them just sit all night at home and signing those forms right and uh, and when money used to come in back then you know a lot of the bank a lot of the money was not banking system wide it had to it had to be done in certain ways uh, basically via cash and which was accounted cash but it was just money was transferred the way it was transferred uh, uh, and uh, i used to i used to sit there and see how how they used to count cash and they had to then go deposit that in the exchange and and the exchange would then you know Pay, uh, pay off the other side. It was. It was a. I mean, I've seen how this stock market literally started in the 80s and where it is today, uh, and, and how easy it is to have a zero da account. It takes you like 30 minutes or 45 minutes to set it up, and then you can have an IDFC connection to it, and you can transfer money, and you can buy stock, and you don't have to worry about anything. There's everything is pretty kosher. Now we're getting to T plus one, which means we get settlement in the next day. Life has changed a lot, right? And so, so that struggle, I think really uh, changes you right i think uh, uh, and i believe that you know if you if, if you're part of that generation and and people of my age that have seen their parents struggle i mean let's not forget vishal this is an era where you know sometimes income tax was 97% right you you so if you earned 100 rupees 97 rupees of that went to tax and sometimes i wonder when when 
when a team member comes and cribs about paying 22% tax and they said do you realize <laughs> 30 years ago you would be paying you know 40 50% of your income as tax uh wow, that's the that reason they do a volume of trade they want to increase the volume just for that reason exactly because it, it didn't make any sense why, why would somebody start a business and then pay 97% of his income as tax we better of being a government employee right and and having uh, you know and having your uh, income coming from other sources too so i think that that that's where it all uh, uh, comes to me that you know that i i saw that struggle i was part of that internet generation right i think we were the first guys who stood in, stood in line at bsnl where you used to get a 500 rupee recharge for a dial up internet and used to give you something i i think it was a 100 mbp 100 mb connection was 500 rupees or something like that and yeah. it was uh, and uh, it was how would i put it like and then obviously today you see how things have changed it it, it sombers you right i think it it grounds you to the fact that yeah how far have we come but how much more do we have to go right and I, and i think uh, coming from that generation seeing the way things have, have changed and how things how fast things are changing now it, it having that grounded reality in what we used to be uh, doesn't make a huge difference uh, in in you know appreciating what you have today so i i don't i don't don't as much complain with the ecosystem today because i i, have, i mean you and i have seen how the ecosystem was 30 years ago so there's no yeah, that, that, that's exactly what i want what i ask you you take ownership of things and when you're a founder you do take ownership of things and in the old days like you said your your father was thrust into the business very early because of a family tragedy and they took ownership because they had to save the family right i mean many ways that was the truth of it and they built a career around it ownership for the second or third or fourth generation right keeps dropping yeah and uh, and for some reason the visions are lost i see parallels in many ways that way I, i mean for example the current one is the current one is about build quickly and sell quickly and exit so the ownership for me is short term yeah but it, you know I, because you've seen that world what does ownership mean to you today from a family business perspective and from a startup perspective a lot of it also is vishal is that what's the intent of being in business right i think uh, there are people have uh, there is the great book right by uh, clayton christians and that which is how will you measure your life uh, and and you know and what what drives you to do what you're doing today why do you wake up why do i wake up why do we get out of bed you know i'm sure all of us have enough money that we could at least survive a year or two without doing anything right but we do get out of bed and we do go to work for whatever reason and and something beyond work is motivating us that we're sitting here and having this conversation uh, so to me i i've always thought about leaving a legacy right i i i've always thought about companies with the, with the intent saying that uh, companies need to have a voice right companies need to have a culture they 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 are a separate human being and and they can be a service to society and they then they play a very very important part for society and overall so to me it's always been that when i'm setting up this company when i'm setting up artha it's it's something that is not going to be a uh, associated with the with the whole damani family effectively right i i want artha to be its own independent entity its own independent thought and i and to be able to attract talent that wants to really go out there and build something right take ownership of things and that i i think we've done a my team has done a fantastic job we have about 50 people of 50 entrepreneurs i would say some of them entrepreneurs some of them entrepreneurs but that that take ownership of things i i literally don't run things here and i uh, and I, and i set myself up to say that you know i i don't want to run things over here so you know as as we go along more and more responsibility gets handed out and that's how we're going to grow as an organization now many people for for many of them uh, a business could also be a means to an end so they want to get it to get it to a certain uh, size set it off and then they they have other ambitions in life to fulfill and for some people the business is their identity right that that you know when the business doesn't do well they personally are not doing well when the business is doing well then they're personally doing well and i don't want to have that identity with my business right i, I think I, i have i have my own voice and artha has his own voice and the good thing is many times our voices do align but many times you know what i believe may not uh, be agreed to by artha and it, it, it's part and parcel that's how virgin and richard branson work right it's it's, it's not always uh, in uh, unison but they are working towards the same goal lovely and uh, you know early days i mean i like what you said famously i mean you said the core elemental experiences that made you into master businessman or woman are missing in the second generation you yeah. said that from a family it, it, context it, it, it also even applies. in my gen 
even in no. my generation even in my generation like i can see a huge difference between me and let's say uh, my cousins or even my brother that were they were born 7 8 10 years later right because by that time the struggle the struggle had turned into growth right so you didn't see the struggle you came in like my brother my, my brother was born there was already a, a maruti esteem in the house there's already we're buying a second car right and 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 i remember uh, scooters right and, and i don't think he, he remembers that era right my my sister remembers some part of that era and then the the kid that came after that uh, then there were three cars by that time right? there was there was two offices and there was a larger office i saw my dad in a 150 square foot office with 15 16 people in that office right if somebody had to go inside everybody had to stand up and that's how you got inside right Which office was it was in the south, south bombay but, uh, it was at, it was at the uh, this uh, the bsc tower right uh-huh. yeah. The, and it was the uh, office number 726 on the seventh floor and it was literally 150 square feet right and it was you could he literally crammed as many people as you could right i sometimes think that they, they were a synchronized swimming team because i don't know how they worked they were elbow to elbow right and you have so many uh, files to open and things to do but that's how the business started you know and 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 i don't and the so when i say next generation sometimes i feel there's a generation gap between me and 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 my own first cousins and, and my own brother because what i experience and what they experienced as uh, this family legacy is very very different and uh, okay. so th- you know in many ways they probably are also a lot more risk taking than i am uh, because i also have remember that we we had a era where you know there was uh, uh, we were hand to mouth absolutely so these are the core elemental experiences you talk about that are we are we all victims of the past so because we've seen something we fear it and therefore conservative or we we can also also use it to our advantage right because if we if we went through an era where you know we've seen seen uh, being hand to mouth and we could survive and we could live uh, then guess what we can do it again right and i think uh, if, as we talk about you know how how uh, i got to door to door sales and other stuff right it was always like i've seen the worst i mean how much worse could it get right if if we've done that i can definitely do this and i think as long as you go with that as long as you keep facing your fears rather than running away from them the fears keep running away from you yeah and that's true and another than this generation can you know can look at failure more openly and their freedom to experiment which in those days in your dad's time uh, after your grandfather passed away god bless him i mean if he had failed there was there would be a lot of there would be a lot of difficulty it'd be very difficult for an indian to come back in that generation very true and, and and failure was counted as and to to be honest there was failure i think what also see scarcity is the mother of invention right that's what we always keep saying so what happened was they were they were never always stuck in one business they kept doing more and more and more and they would keep finding places to do business if you could earn an extra 2 rupees somewhere else then let's let's figure out that business too and and i think that was the brilliance of that generation they just didn't know how to pay they just thought failure was okay failure is that i didn't understand the business failure wasn't a an expression of that i'm dumb or i'm stupid right it it was more like i didn't understand it maybe to understand it better oh guess what there's another business where people are making money let me go try that and let me keep trying something till i figure out where i can make a lot of money right and then i can just continue uh, that business uh, as long as uh, i can ride that wave and in many ways it's the life of a surfer right you keep chasing waves right doesn't mean you're going you're going to ride every single wave that comes your way right but but that just because you got wiped out by a wave doesn't mean you stop surfing altogether you know it it, well it, it is many ways yeah that is many well ways that kind of i think i think i think you talked about sandboxes and and you say that today sandboxes in the startup world are taken for granted uh in fact very loosely also but uh, i wish it was there in our generation as well sandboxing is very important very but, true. but 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 a sandboxing itself i think i think if you looked at your dad and his brother they had a sandbox privately but they wouldn't have shared it with anybody i'm sure yeah i think they also see at that time and it also makes a big difference as you go along uh, vishal is that as you start generating some wealth right then you then, then you start wondering am i putting all my wealth at stake right but early on when you have no wealth then whatever you have is at stake right so i think uh, sandboxing comes probably when you say okay i've got i used to have 10 rupees and so i i can bet it all and if i goes to zero as it is was 10 rupees not going to make it but as that 10 becomes a thousand for example right then you say okay i can't bet the entire thousand because if that goes to zero i won't be able to make the thousand back or it'll take me so many years to do it so so i think that there 
their sandboxing wasn't there and, and i think many business families in india and you've seen these horror stories that have happened uh, all of them over exposed to real estate right or they are very over exposed to a sector because they never sandbox things it was like real estate is doing well we're making money keep pumping money into it because it's making us money like the largest scam in india or the largest loss in india in the listed uh, or in the um uh, that uh, you know the the uh, the financial space was nscl right 5500 crores wiped out now these were smart people none of these guys that that lost money in any way they're some of the sharpest minds in financial world in india but there was no sandboxing there was no intent ki, you know out of my entire wealth i should only be putting so much interest over here so that listen is giving us 15 18% less just pump all the money we can over there right real estate giving you 25% pump all the money over there and then when it goes for a you know when it gets stuck you then realize well, you know i just overextended myself there was no sandboxing there was no planning it's happening now the whole family of his culture that you know you've got x amount of money you know one, one this much of x has to go into fixed income this much of x has to go into equities so much has to go into real estate so much has to go into your business i think that men- mentality that thought process is happening now after seeing the wipe out of the last 10 to 15 years <laughs> indian billionaires have been wiped out right wiped out multi generational wealth you know wiped out by creating airlines wiped out by creating media companies uh, all of which have not worked wiped out by creating you know <laughs> mutual fund houses uh, that did not work out i think all of that has now taught the new generation or the or the new wealth manager uh, ma- you know the new class that has to manage the wealth that we need to have some sort of a strategy here and we need to sandbox the thing we can't let you know the next generation's son or daughter or whoever i want to support i give them so much money that if they if they fail and there is a good chance they will that wipes out the entire wealth that we've created right they, they can wipe out a bit i am willing to take that risk but i can't take a risk big enough that it really puts me on the back foot by 15 20 years got it got it i mean did you were you on the ring side of all these uh, early changes in india i mean you mentioned the history of it watching them Uh, did you sit with these two individuals your dad more so and your uncle any particular learning because i want to go into you know how curious a person you are because you went to us and you ended up working while you were also studying and you ended up running a business right and more so get into the energy business without any knowledge of it right and run it well for a few years right and uh, i want to know how did that happen i want you to connect the past and that situation of you studying and getting into the energy business yeah so i i think the first uh, uh, my first experience with the us you know i went after the 10 right and i went i went there and i was like you know i uh, i in fact wanted to do my high school over there 11th and 12th i i i got into a high school and i then the columbine shooting happened which was and then my dad got all freaked out and had to come back to india uh, and uh, But, but when i was there i really i i really was in awe of how independent even those high schoolers were right they were they were uh, you know they would be you know you, you, there was a couple of times at the house you had those uh, you had those uh, girls who were selling girls scout cookies you saw lemonade stands right and people were selling lemonade and you wonder okay you know you're living in this nice neighborhood why are you selling lemonade you know it doesn't make any sense if i was selling lemonade on the side of the street people would think my dad is bankrupt right in india but in the us you know this was this was the kids were taught to be entrepreneurial right you want you want you want an allowance go mow the lawn you know you 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 want to make some extra money you know go sell, go sell girl scout cookies or if you've read the snowball by uh, warren buffett you know he 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 did the newspaper route and then he uh, ran ran vending machines and then he ran you know the spinball machines and all that stuff i just think that mindset really really you know uh, got on with me so i was like it doesn't matter how i'm going to go back to the us right after after my 12th right i'll figure a way uh, and again this was again a time we didn't have a lot of money so i i had to get myself a scholarship and then head out to the us my first year i went to i wanted to do computer science because i thought i was good with technology i, I thought you know, computer science is what you should be doing you didn't have back then a lot of uh, you know, knowledge on the internet as we do today you know like you might like technology but you may, may not be a great coder there's two different things you know uh flunked out first year of college I, i think i at the end of my first year of college i had a gp of like 1.2 or 1.3 on a scale of 4 right and 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 i i got a letter in the mail uh, it went to my dad unfortunately that uh, your son's scholarship is is under review and and i got and obviously got a call and a pasting uh, and i said no don't worry i'm i'm going to fix this 
I just realized I'm not built to do computer science. I'm not built to write code. I I can't sit for hours at night. But I believe I know what I believe I now know my calling. So I I taken up a job in selling jewelry. Okay, okay. over 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 that. Uh, in during the time I was in this uh, uh, like crazy phase, and I remember the first day at the job, and and I think this this experience changed me for life for life. Right, so there was this guy. I call him uh, my brother, and he's really he's a brother. He's like a elder brother to me. He's you know he's he's the sole reason. You you are still in touch with him? <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, in fact, whenever I go back to Texas, I I visit the store every single time because uh, he's still running it. And uh, so I remember first day at the job, there's a woman, and she's come. So it's a jewelry store, you know, it's nice jewelry over there, and she's come to buy a Zippo lighter, a Zippo lighter, right? And she wants the name of her husband engraved on the back. and it's a 40 dollar or 45 dollar lighter at the time she has two of her grandchildren with her and i and i just saw how he took that woman buying a zippo lighter and he ended up selling her a bracelet worth 2500 dollars and wow. by the great way, sales man i mean must be a smooth talker but the way he did it was 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 you know like he actually said convince the kids to buy the bracelet right and the grandmother then had to agree And and the and and the funny thing was that he still made her pay for the Zippo and then gave her a free Zippo lighter, and I was like, why don't you just give her give it to her free? He's like, you know that that is ethics. She came for that, she has to pay for it. I'll give her another I'll give her another lighter, <laughs> you know, as for free. But the one she came for, she has to pay. And then that that and then he gave me a book that you can sell anything, and he's by by a guy called Joe Girard, who's the who holds the world record for selling the most number of cars, twenty seven thousand cars in his career, uh, and uh, I, I think. that was like oh my god if i could learn that skill what he just showed me i could change the world right because i mean imagine you can you can literally get people to do what you want but they think they are the ones doing wanting it right and, and it changed the way i thought about sales it changed the way i thought about business and that's when i became you know took up economics and business administration as my major finished that in 3 years so it finished double major starting with zero uh, and i finished uh, i think with a with i think a 3.5 gpa i got you know i think i, I got into the some on society of economics I, i don't remember the name now but uh, but it effectively changed the way i thought right it it changed the way i looked at business i changed the, it changed that aversion i had for being a businessman i like you know it's 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 about actually giving people what they want because most people don't know what they want and so that woman didn't want she didn't know that she wanted the bracelet right she came for a zippo but he convinced her that she wanted the bracelet to she he created a need filled it and it all of that happened in 15 minutes right and that that was life changing i like what you said you know you tell people what you want but they think they've done it that's phenomenal yeah, I, i know it's it's actually not even that you don't tell them you you have to figure out a way it's like uh, okay you don't tell them. you okay it's, it's inception they, it has to be their yeah. thought the minute people think that you have told them what you know you have told them something they won't buy it right people don't like to be sold they want to be they want to buy so the power is in their hand but the point is how can you get them to buy right and and i think one of the things i always and i'm getting infamous for it in the in 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 with startups is that i always say that you give things for free you're never going to make a valuable business right Absolutely. you get them to pay because they want it and they, and if you're fulfilling a need you figure out exactly what your business is going to be and 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 i think that 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 was a pivotal experience and then after that i worked i worked for at the jewelry store for four years straight uh all through i used to work through christmas every single year i then joined a, a cell phone store i joined uh and then you know obviously uh, i i i had a pretty uh, nice social scene back in back in college so i uh, you know to, for dates and stuff I, i had to start cleaning up gas stations right so i used to do that and and then i uh, eventually got into a mobile phone business that i ran from my dorm room so i was i had a very full life and and i was by the way part as a junior uh, as a junior student i was actually part of uh, managing uh, or a teacher's assistant for a senior class because i was so far into my major that i had already finished all, all the all the courses they didn't have anything to give me so they gave me something that i uh, that that you know uh, i could manage and and i think those 3 4 years i was so busy i was so into things and and uh, you know i had a great social life like i said it wasn't just about studying i did i did i literally had the best experience you could have in the us 
but i did everything i i i i ran i i did three jobs i you know i ran a business so when i graduated i was just like you no know, i want to just continue with this you know i want to continue with this experience with this whole experience building that i have of doing different different things so i got a job to i got a job offer to uh, join a mobile phone company and manage the north north america uh, north texas division because i had sold so many mobile phones that they they wanted me to head that division for for north texas uh and that was a fixed pay job and it's like 40 50000 dollars a year or something like that and and you would get a car allowance and then i said how much is the bonus and he said well now we will give you like 5000 dollars every year i said what am i going to do with that if you want me to drive sales and the max i can make is 5000 dollars i'll just be driving around in the car doing nothing and then i somehow got into a room and then telling for another job at a startup that my senior was working at and he said listen i want you to come into this um, and it's into this room where we're doing the sales seminar and where you know sales team is getting trained you should really come meet this indian because i think he's one of the coolest indians that I've, i've ever met and i was like uh, samir i am actually the coolest indian you've ever met no 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 you may <laughs> think you're cool but come check this thing out right and uh, went to that room and who did and you meet i'm curious michael now. germana uh-huh. michael germana he was michael germana he was a uh, a uh, 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 punjabi uh, Uh, born in uh, canada had been selling long term energy contracts door to door in uk in canada he sold long distance door to door he was a, he was and is a legend in the space the number of people that he has trained and where each one of us is in life right we owe we owe him a huge debt of gratitude right and 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 other debts as well like other debts of, of you know like the fact that he's made us who we are today and i'm uh, the way he controlled that room 50 people in suits the way he controlled that room for the next 5 hours he got us to learn a two page presentation word for word every single person in the room knew word for word within 5 hours within within, a, within by the end of that day and i said again that's a skill you need to learn that's a skill that that needs to be replicated i, I he to, he gave me a job he said no fixed pay if you don't sell you don't make anything uh took it up and then you know uh, first day at the job i think sold six deals and the second day i wrote 10 deals in the day and that literally just set me up i i next thing you know i was a team leader and then uh, they uh, when they started a commercial division say nobody goes to door to door sales vishal who has a degree right people that go there are usually people that don't have a degree or they have some sort of a record because they can't get a corporate job so when they decided to start a commercial division they were looking for a person with a degree There's only two people: the president of the company and myself, for a degree in the company. <laughs> so we de facto became the head of the commercial department, and we we set it up. We became number one commercial brokers in Texas in the matter of six months. Next thing you know, Suez comes along. Suez is the world's largest energy company. They said, "Listen, we want to give you a nationwide uh, rollout. If you guys can set up in the similar offices for us across the country." And and that that was it. We were we were we had the one of the most lucrative contracts in energy. for a five year period and we used to say this was this was suez money that we got like this suez paid us top dollar and and they gave us amazing budgets you worked with a fortune 100 company uh you know and with with an unlimited balance sheet and and they said okay we want to we want to start this new uh we want to start a new uh city and then and they would roll it out and they just had the money it was amazing right and and after doing that for five years you 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 really realize you know what what uh, power is all about how did you cope with this i mean the energy business uh, i mean obviously you were under such stock broking and everything but the energy business would be similar that i mean was it were you trading commodity energy commodity or were you trading were you just doing derivatives so no what you know we weren't trading commodities you know what we did and so was 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 that we would go to uh, home owners we would go to business owners and we would help them hedge their power costs for the next 5 years Uh, at a fixed price right and and in the us you've got the energy markets where you can trade up to 5 years energy futures right uh so i probably understood that a little better because i came from a finance background but effectively did, i think 99% of the people that work with us didn't understand that they only understood that this is what you pay and this is what you can pay now uh the way it was done was that suez had an unlimited balance sheet so they would go out and hedge the power for the next 5 years and 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 they they would charge a premium on what they had paid and that's what the consumer uh, had to pay and then he, the only assurance he had to make was that that he would not switch energy providers for 5 years because his power cost per hedge and if he did change then he had to pay a massive penalty because so then had to unroll the entire contract and then whatever losses they incurred had to be paid by uh, these guys 
Uh, but it was great because for five years, between 2005, 2010, uh, 2009, I, I, the power prices went up 20, 25% year on year. So people had no problem hedging because they wanted to hedge. Um, and, and and 2009 is, I, I think, uh, 2008 was the best year. I would say best year in uh, in history uh, of me being in business. Uh, I was on 160 odd flights. I mean, I was on a flight every two days. Yeah. Like, Have you seen the movie up in the air? Yeah. I, I, I can identify. <laughs> yeah, yeah. South. I, I had so many flights with Southwest that I, that you know Southwest. I, I could stand at the counter after checking in, right next to the door, and tell them I'm not taking this flight. I'll take the next one. And then there, there was a day where I just kept doing so many conference calls back to back, Vishal. That I was at the airport from 9 a.m. I took the 10 p.m. flight at night because I was just on conference. There were so many big teams, and I was managing all of this. And you know, um, it, it was. It was a great time, man. Yeah. I, I think I think I, my American experience is is unbelievable. You know, I, I think I did everything that you want out of the American experience. I had a great college life. I I had a full like I I I have traveled to almost every single city in Texas. I have flown all across the U.S. Right, very few states that are not touched. You know, probably the northeastern states uh, are the ones. Uh, sorry, the the northwestern states are the ones I've not touched. The, yeah, the Pacific Northwest. I drove overnight from Dallas to Chicago. I've driven from Dallas to Boston. I mean, I, 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 I think I really enjoyed, and I look back at my 12 years in the U.S. with a very, uh, you know, uh, you know. With and some, you survived the crisis. Yeah, I bought the business in the crisis. In the crisis is when, when we, when you know, the Suez overnight said we can't sell, right? And 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 that that led to a big problem because we had so many salespeople. We had like 15 officers. We I, we had fifteen offices at the time, so we keep have keep having these. Uh, random no, it doesn't things. matter. Let, let's keep this recorded because it's fine. It's natural. Right? I want to know how did you, you bought? So the company was bought, is it at the time? So the company was was owned by Mike and and a couple of his uh, 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 you know business partners. And in two thousand nine, because the way things all collapsed, right? It, it, we had a we we were faced with a situation where we either shut down the company or we would eventually go bankrupt, right? And and so uh, Mike said, listen, let's just shut this thing down. And then me and a couple of buddies were like, listen, I think there's some value here. I mean, to continue the legacy. So uh, we decided to pull in all our savings. We bought out the company. And we decided, you know what? Uh, you know, obviously not a very wise decision, you know, from my dad's uh, perspective. He was like, what the heck are you doing? All the money you made in life is all over this company now. Well, listen, what's the worst that could happen? The same thing I was talking about. What's the worst that could happen? If, if this isn't work out, I'll come back and I'll work with you in the stockbroking business. Right? We'll figure this thing out. But if I learned how to turn around a struggling business, if I learned as an owner what it takes, right? because it was great to not be an owner and to just get your paycheck at the end of the month and you know, enjoy a party and all of that and not have to run it operationally. right? But if, if you had to do it as an owner, what would be, be the experience? And over three years, we turned around the business there was a time we were literally down to four dollars in our bank account, right? And we had a seven thousand dollar rent check. We had no idea. We had written the check. We had no idea how that was going to pass the next day. We were maxed out on our credit cards, and we had taken on a, we had taken on our client because they were, you know, we, we had some billing issue with them. So we we decided not to sell for them, and we said we and so now we had no idea where the money was going to come from. And I don't know how the check got passed. And I don't know if the landlord just did not give a, did not pay attention. But with the lights were on for a few more days. And, and from there, the business, the way it turned around, you know, the way we ended that year and, and uh, the the party we had at the end of it was, uh, yeah. I mean, like I said, yeah. You I, exited, you ex- I remember you, ex- you telling me you exited in 2012. 2013, you know, we had a choice. Uh, so both my partners at the time were probably about five to 10 years elder to me. I was just 30. Uh, so, and, and obviously they had seen, some, they had actually seen something really bad. They all had, they all had commitments, right. In, in, uh, in their personal lives. And uh, I, I think uh, they didn't want to take on risks anymore. Right. And, and I said, listen, I'm at 30. It's too early for me to start retiring. Right. So I said, listen, why, why don't we figure out a way that, you know, I can, I can get a clean exit and we'll, we call it quits and, and let me go figure this thing out and let me see if India is the new challenge that I want to go at. And 2011, 12, I was coming to India far more often. Uh, and, yeah, and you set up was, energy, Artha Energy, I remember that. You, yeah. you set it up early. I remember you telling me about uh, being some, I think it was focused on renewable energy consulting. And all it was, that. yeah, the focus, the focus was to basically help 
a lot of these US power companies wanted to open up India. And the Indian power market was supposed to be one of the best. And the, there was a great, very lucrative contracts in renewables and hydro. Uh, but I, I think as soon as I landed in India, UPA and the you know the A to Z of scam started. And so it was the worst name I could have chosen was a broker. So I used to call myself an energy broker. And at that time, broker meant, you know, <laughs> you should be part of the CAG audit, right? That's happening. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so for the next two, three years, I mean, it was, it was a very difficult business and, 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 you know, most policies were so much in flux and like, you know, and business, you, whoever you dealt with, you didn't know how much debt they had and what was going on in their own books and you would, you know, you would do a deal and they could not complete it. Um, so yeah, two, three years was really, really bad, but I think I learned it really the hard way because I, I took on a very, very hard sector. Uh, and while I was doing that is when, you know, this whole thing of like startups is something with startups is happening. I had some, some bit of money. My father also came and said, listen, I'll give you some bit of money, but you, he, he gave me a challenge. We'll talk about it in a bit, but uh, he said, Ki, you know, start investing. We'll see what happens. Uh, I tried my hand, by the way, six months in real estate in Calcutta. Again, you know, whole different world. I mean, Calcutta is like a whole different animal to, to Mumbai. You know, I was about to so, ask you. You enjoyed the US stint so much that would you want to really come back and look at this world? Because India was in a transition, believe me, it was the second biggest transition. I don't think 2001 to 10 was a big transition. Yeah. I think, yes, IT services grew and all that, but damn, mobile generation changed everything. I wondered how did you come in and line it up in Calcutta and what were the expectations? Are, because it took me six months to register the name for my business here in the US. I remember it was a Monday evening. We were sitting around drinking a bo- drinking some beer and deciding the name of our business. We decided that business ka naam ye hona chahiye. And we punched a button. Next day, overnight, we got the company documents. Right? Ki this is the name registered for you. We took those documents to the bank with a ten thousand dollar check, and the bank opened up a bank account. The third day, which is which is forty eight hours from the time we were having beer, by the way, right? <laughs> The bank calls and says, your credit is great. We're giving you $150,000 to start. This is happening in 2009 when the entire financial world is melting down. Here you have a bank who's acting, who's thinking of you and giving up, thinking of giving you service. I come to India, you realize that there is a guy sitting somewhere who you never meet, uh, who has to be given six options of a name that you want for your business. Six. And then he will decide which name sounds best for your business. He right? will decide. You know, I did this. It happens even today. <laughs> yeah. Why? I have no idea. Well, My child accountant asked me six names. <laughs> why, why does the Indian administrative services need to have a guy who needs to decide names for, for, for businesses? Right? I don't understand that. And back then, six months, like, you had no idea. Like, kya ho hai? And, and, and if you can actually Google this, that I think yeah, until uh, 2012 or something, TCS used to manage the Indian uh, MCA portal and then Infosys somehow got the contract and I don't know what both of them did, but the MCA portal was not working for like six to eight months. The entire I, remember country, that. I remember that phase. I mean, we were writing about it in business world and all that. I remember it. So eight months in this country, in this country, the, the third, mo- second most populous in the world, right? The businesses cannot be registered because there is no plan B. The plan, there's only plan A that you, the document should be submitted to MCA. Eight and the site's not working. Said, That's it. And I was like, this country chal kaise rahi hai? You know, like what's happening over here? And you're coming from a US background where everything is cut, cut, cut. You know, you, you want a business credit card, apply kiya, ho gaya. Is there a, a, a naam approve nahi ho pa hai? Uske baad then, chalo naam approve ho gaya. Then the company ke documents came there. Then after that, when he started to open the bank account, Oh my God, I, I, I was like, how many documents do you guys need to get signed? It's every single day, yes, sign karo, wo sign karo. Kutte ka naam kya hai, kutte ke bache ka naam kya hai, papa ka naam kya hai, papa ke papa. I was like, hey, how? And then, and then I was like, I used to wonder like, how can people do business like that? You know, and so I, I think that was one of the reasons why I became an investor because I said, Ki, I understand this pain because I've been an entrepreneur in the US. The people that come from the Indian mindset as business people, you know, from the engineering schools, they have no idea what they're taking on. Right? They have no idea how this is going to work. They're going to be bewildered. And whether will they run all these all these administrative tasks or will they will they build a business? So I, I started working with early stage founders with that intent key. I can help you with sales and I can help you navigate this this entire ecosystem. See again, the guys that open businesses today have no idea. Right? 
so so it, it, you know you have to appreciate how far we've come <laughs> compared to where we were you know i you know in in in, in many cases down. it's it's it, a lot of things are online you know you, your bank is actually trying to be a, be of service to you tab to the banks were different it's and, 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 and lot of, and i'm glad that you're bringing this in context because you seen life without anything in the 80s yeah you know all the way up to 93 94 maybe then you obviously go the experience the american life where things are getting done fast smooth it's you know then you come back it's still the same pace but a little different of course yeah right but then it's all changed now right it's completely fast in many ways it is fast it is changing uh, you know i hope you are right i hope certain government portals are still look at upi i think upi yeah upi is, is the best product let's give them credit yeah. where it is yeah you upi i think aadhar if you look at digilocker you know there is a fundamental shift in in the way the government wants you know back then vishal remember no government agency used to trust the numbers of another government agency so if you have to define yourself in india you had a ration card number then you had a pan number then you had you know uh, the eci the election card number then you had you know din number like itne sare number pa kar kya rahe ho right in the us you only had one social security number that was it and in certain states the driver's license number was different from the social but in most states your social was the same as the driver's license in india is to want a passport number alag ye number alag wo number alag so when you're submitting you're submitting all these documents to just prove that i am who i am right vishal krishna is a living person is defined by the 15 numbers that define him right i agree i think now and now we just have the other other and the credit and i i think there's a lot of rationalization i i think i i think you're right india is so complex and sometimes the americans and the english people ask me uh, is india an assault on your senses i think it is an assault but we still have uh, we still have done done very well we have a long way to go of course but when i look at you i mean i've seen the way you've supported oyo uh, x hotel and others right you know those changes wouldn't have happened if not for the smartphone uh, re- revolution that happened here absolutely you know I don't know I how you made that transition. I'd be wondering. I mean, some coming from a stock broking, I would think okay, energy. You know, then you probably get into the same thing here. But then you redefined everything by starting Artha, right? At the time, as a, as an investment thesis, he was also linked to energy at the time. The early, it, early initially, Artha. yeah. The the first business Artha Energy Resources was obviously in energy only, right? Artha India Ventures came much later. As a, it actually came as an afterthought of like while I'm waiting for name approvals for seven months, what am I doing? right so so that's when you know this whole this whole experiment started with arth india ventures uh but you know what was very 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 interesting uh, was you know some of the businesses that i invested in or actually the implementation of technology that i done in my business in the us so exotel actually came from the idea that i had actually used something like exotel back in 2009 and 10 to create that to to for uh, answering of phone calls in the us right and we had implemented that in our organization we were one of the first companies to use microsoft dynamics in 2009 10 we spent 50000 dollars having that built out custom built for us we had a crm back in 2010 so you when you come from that level and then you come to india and see what's not available you you start you know you start adopting technology or pushing it very 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 quickly right we 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 i don't think we ever used excel in the history of the of arthandia ventures for deal flow management till date we've used every single software available if you we use european software to us software we have used indian software for deal flow management because mm-hmm. i understood from very early stage that excel se nahi hoga right you you want bi on top of it you want to understand your mistakes and, that, and i think that it came because we i came from a business where numbers mattered my boss used to say that in sales you either have numbers or you have a bloody good story right you 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 can't have both right you you, you come to me you have you, you promised me 15 numbers you got 15 or you have a bloody good story why you missed out right but you know so 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 we used to track 500 sales people in a crm you know at that time and used to track and we used to figure out patterns of how they each one of them was performing you could figure out by numbers and this is something my boss at that time taught me like you can figure out from numbers which one of these agents is on a hot streak which one is actually on a down streak which one is scamming the system right and which one is struggling with the system so today when we look at startups and I talk to the startups about weekly reporting and yeah. and you know being very very open and transparent with numerical reporting that it comes from that what i've done for 16 17 years 
is checking numbers and letting numbers drive the decisions and not not just my gut feeling right and and usually gut feeling also changes that right? if some spicy food your gut might change feeling might change with it right so so you, you have to be careful you know because fear changes a lot of lot lot of your you know a lot, lot of your decisions are driven by fear sometimes because you're not willing to face the numbers but if you face the numbers you might find something interesting and next thing you know it turns into a business that's what happened with oyo right yeah why, why did we go from arrival stage to oyo it, it's because that we figured something out or that they figured something out in the numbers right and many of these businesses that have had these really interesting pivots right lane lane club has done so well in the last yeah two years just figuring out that people looking for small ticket loans came from the numerical reporting that they did every week and then they built a product and it's worth 400 crore per month right now so uh, it's no, really I mean, these small things you know that that make that huge impact i i'm glad how do you transform that into the team for you how do you do that in the fund uh, i mean it's very tough because in the startup world i see chaotic there no there's nothing defined things are changing things are i mean perhaps your conservative nature makes you report say that look i only trust data nothing else yeah in in many ways we also inculcate that habit in our in our program right so we we develop a program internally of how uh, we're going to train uh, you know people that are freshers all the way up to becoming fund managers right i think i think the division for artha venture fund is to be a space where we have multiple fund managers all cooperating with each other with individual funds for each fund manager right and and the way we set it up we can talk on another call it'll take up, it'll take up yeah. half the call to explain another way yeah i know but yeah. the intent is that uh, whenever somebody joins us uh, they usually start off as a portfolio analyst for 18 months their only job and these are usually people that have a strong research finance background in the last couple of years of work experience uh, they usually start off by spending 18 months just working with four portfolio companies and that may go to six uh, and 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 if the company graduates uh, into becoming much bigger then they might have to get a new company but the intent is to give them a lot of experience of working with founders when founders don't need the money you know founder I, needs money yeah founder go on pad me i interjected you go on so i realized over a period of time that early on we used to let analysts immediately start working with founders and they used to get the sense of power right yeah. because guess what when the founder needs money he'll jump to any hoop he want right but just because you know you get you get a lion to 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 jump through a hoop of fire doesn't make you a brave person right it's just that you you beat him enough that he has to do that uh however once the founder has money how can you not be valuable to him or her right uh, for that matter so that's where we started that you know 18 months you spend with a founder where the founder does not need money but you have to prove your value to him that when you call him he should pick up the phone right and that is only possible when you become an associate an assistant to the founder and help him in achieving the goals that he has all that money cannot achieve so yeah i got it instead of just calling him saying what's where's the growth you yeah practically tell me why them. tell me why they are not growing you know then some yeah. of these guys that that are with us now for two years some of them have seen companies go from 10 lakhs turnover to straight you know 4 crore 5 crore a month so they they have so much stories now to tell a new founder then they spend 18 months working with new founders right and then after once they've had 18 months of new founders 18 months of portfolio then only they become an associate so so what happens is that over that three year period they have gained so much experience in in okay. seeing good founders and seeing founders that struggled in seeing founders that 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 you know grew up things and and, and even founders that that really built something that they get a multivariate experience they have a lot of respect for the founder See, they they develop a sense of respect because now they see the guy struggling. It's not all about the money, is what they realize, right? And, and I think that's when they talk to a founder. They they come they come with a sense of empathy, right? And not with a sense of like entitlement. Ki boss, they ko paisa diya, they ko jo bola ukar, right? That is some of the attitudes that I see with with analysts. They're you know like as if it is your own money that you're deploying. But the point is, it's not easy to run a business. Right? So how do you develop the empathy? try making them a founder yourself see vishal you're a founder now i think your respect for founders will go up tremendously Actually, when you become yes. a founder yourself right i, I told like, you my i told you my uh, experience with the gst guys today so yeah so so ye this many of your founders you're interviewing have to deal with this stuff every single day yeah you develop a self respect in it. it looks all hunky dory outside but it's not all that is made out to be okay now see you've been successful uh no you know now floats excel you know we phrase i remember these are companies that wrote about oyo 
Yeah, I think Lindin Club, uh, Club Lindin Club confirmed ticket were all part of your deal, right? I mean, they were, you've supported them from the beginning. And now Purple, of course, and uh, one more company, I forget. I mean, there's one more big exit. Agnico. Yeah, correct. Agnico. Uh, the, uh, Karza, the recent one. Karza, yes, Karza, right? My, with all this, does, does it mean you're successful? What does it mean to you? Because there's, there's people celebrating in the ecosystem today and, uh, and it's only just beginning. Right. I, I wanted to ask you because you're a fan of uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah. Right. And <clears throat> I wanted to know what, where are we? Are we all outliers in India at this point of time? Uh, every Indian aspires to do something big. But, but off late, I see some chinks in the armor. We've spoken about it in the past. Uh, your thoughts on where we are heading, where is Artha heading? Right. And uh, I'll get to the final two questions, which are easy. But this, I want definite answers too, because I think your knowledge on this would be very important. I think, see, we've come a long ways in ecosystem, right? We've come from an ecosystem, uh, I think, up to, up, when I even started Artha Venture Fund, you know, so we, I was part of the largest angel exit that had happened in the history of angel investing in India, which was OYO in 2016. So we yeah, entered at a, yeah, half a million valuation exit at a billion. Uh, and, and I think that fundamentally changed the mindset around what a startup is and the fact that a startup can actually make money, right? For the investor and, and, and also can become a big business. By 2019, Oyo by itself was worth more than all the listed Koreka companies in India. Altogether combined was 66,000 crores. Oyo, I think, was some 75,000 crores at the time, right? It fundamentally changed the way even businesses or even business houses started thinking about startups. Until then, startups were something like, that, oh, it sounds good, but I agree with you. You remember in 2009, I, I won't name the company. There was a young security company doing very well. Uh, 10 months in the business generating cash. You know what? I was told by my one of my senior editors at the time saying, oh, kya hai startup here. He actually said that. Yeah. <laughs> and he dropped that story. And today they became a, they're a bigger company. I mean, and those, and you're right. Absolutely. People don't remember that. People didn't care about startups in India. Yeah. And to, today you have Mr. Anand Mahindra on Twitter saying Ki, this is a great company. Like so it tells you how much the psyche of business uh, business founders today, right? People that like Anand Mahindra, these are billionaire guys that have built businesses across and for a long, long time. When they start saying Ki, Mirko, you know, they now realize there could be four engineers sitting in a room somewhere with a business guy and thinking about how to take down Mahindra's one of Mahindra's units. Through some Absolutely. new innovation that they're coming, right? And so they they now want to get ahead of that, or they want to they want to be part of that. Like why, why would Hero be part of Ether, right? It, all of these are to ensure that that we're part of this new thing that's happening, and we can no longer deny that this is the future. Now, obviously, that gives a lot of confidence for people to come out and set up businesses. Does each and every business mean that 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 they're a VC fundable? Absolutely not. VCs fund less than one percent of the businesses out there. And, and to be honest, VCs actually manage less than 1% of all capital out there. We obviously make the most amount of sound. So I, I'm, I'm very, very clear that, you know, if you compare what the private equity guys manage, right? Like each guy must be managing what four or five of our fund managers together are managing. And, and you don't hear about these names, right? You don't hear about them, in, you know, on Twitter and, and people following them and, and, you know, basically idolizing them in some way. But I guess for some reason, VCs do have that, uh, that aura about them. But it, it, the fundamental thing that's happened is I think we've gotten a little too far ahead of ourselves. It happened in 15, 16, right? When OYO things became big, suddenly everybody wanted to fund any, uh, any guy with an 18-year-old that hasn't graduated but has an idea. Let's fund it 2 million and see what happens. Right? And, and you, you remember all the write-offs that have happened from that 2016? Several. Era. Several. I do, I do remember them. And now what's happened, I think, towards the end of 2021 is that, you know, you had those amazing IPOs and there was like, you know what, a lot of money to be made. Let's start funding these things together. This could go, this party can go on for a bit. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of the cases, I think the companies, you know, and, and without naming them, a lot of them are also in, in, in some sort of regulatory or legal trouble. A lot of it is also coming from the fact that they had, they got way too much, way too big quickly. Right. They got way too money, too much money quickly there. I mean, I, I, I've heard of a company that's gone from, some 20 people or two, two founders or 12,000 people in, in a quarter, right? In a quarter, 12,000 people. I don't know what to do with, I've hired 20 people in the last six months. 
and I, and and we're already facing an existential crisis over here. There's a civil war going on for space in my office, right? And and, and here is a company hiring twelve thousand. Now what happens with that level of scale, Vishal? Things are going to burst somewhere, especially if that central idea of reporting and having you know sustainable. Yeah, going back to your point, yeah, going back to your point of reporting. Transparency, accountability. Yeah. See, I I gave you that example. Remember last week we were talking, and I said, listen, imagine if you if you were uh, getting on a flight, uh, or rather, you know, you were in in mid air with, and and suddenly the the pilot's door, uh, you know, flungs open, and and suddenly you see the pilot ha- only has a stick in his hand, and and the entire screen in front of him is dark, and it's raining outside, and the pilot is just randomly taking his stick and going going left and right based on what he thinks is right. Now, how comfortable are you going to be on that flight? No, we're going to crash. The pilot has yeah has no idea where he is in the world, at what speed is he flying, at what height is he at, right, and what's in front of him. Now, most founders, I believe, are running their company like that, but they would not get on the flight like that. But they want to run companies like that, and that is a big, big, big red flag for me. That when a founder is averse to reporting, it means that they that they don't know what they're doing. And, and that's why they're scared to see the numbers because they don't really know that when I see the numbers, am I actually going to enjoy seeing what I am, you know, going to get? But truly, if you just face those numbers, you'll figure out what the business is. It is our uh, Marwadis and Gujaratis have this uh, habit, right? Every every Friday, check your tail balance. Every Friday, Friday, right? And I think that 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 culture, if if startups put founders perkered into themselves, they will build fantastic business. We have way too much talent, way too much. You yeah. know, uh, smart people not to build amazing businesses, right? It's just that we have to get over this fear of number reporting. It's not about reporting to your investors, but reporting to yourself. And once you know the number yourself, you know them like the back of your hand. You can't go wrong. No, that's that's wonderful. I think you know all the lessons learned from you. Sometimes I think we can go on for hours. Two questions: You are placing a lot of emphasis on mental health, physical health. One: uh, Why should people be in that zone and space? It, a lot of people say that nay, yar, paisa ban jaane do, us samay dekhenge. But I disagree, right? You got to be on that mental Absolutely. and physical health all the time. Finally, I want to re- I want you to recommend books. You recommended a marketing book earlier that changed your life when you were at the jewelry store. I want you to repeat its name uh, and recommend some more books. So I'll talk about maybe the the mental and physical health bit. I think obviously uh, over the last year I've lost like twenty two odd kilos, right? Uh, I saw myself. So after after I finished raising this fund, um, and and we had our own journey, right? We had two bouts of COVID hit us in between this fund, and and uh, so we we our fundraising kept getting derailed, and we had to get back on get you know get the plane back on track, and then and, and then it would get derailed again. Uh, So I, I realized when I was just uh, sitting with my nephew and I was singing him a song and I was taking a video, and I looked at the video. I goes, "Who the heck is this guy that's singing the song?" Right? Because I I looked at least fifty five years old, and I said, "This." And I looked like I was sick, and and I, I around that time I lost my mentor and my uncle, uh, who was one of the pioneers of the business with me, and he he passed away to to stomach cancer, and 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 I said I I cannot wait. Until something is big that I I that I don't enjoy what I have actually built right and and I said I'm going to find a way to to get my health back on track. I got onto a program and then uh, you know the the what's happened after that is is that obviously this uh, avatar that I am today. However, I've also made it a point that you know that that work wise I I I work twelve hours days. So it's not like I'm not working. But the point is that when I go home, I do not like to touch my laptop. I do not like to take phone calls. I, in fact, I've allocated two days, and you know, you, you've got the uh, the PR team right here. They'll tell you that I've allocated two days in a week where I don't take any meetings. Those are my days to do long form work. Those are my days to think. Uh, because as an entrepreneur, right? Uh, there's a great book called the E Myth, and I think you know you're asking for suggestions. Every entrepreneur should read that book, the E Myth. Right. The reason I recommend it is because It it actually explains what the core of a business is. There are three people working in a business at all times. There is a technician, there is a manager, and there is an entrepreneur. At the early stages of the of the business, you are sometimes all three of those people. Okay, technician is the guy who's got to do the job. Manager is the guy who's got, who's got to make sure that you know whatever goals have that have been set up are getting done, and you are on track with the technician who's doing the work. And the entrepreneur is the guy who's always dreaming. 
right he's always thinking of new ways to do stuff so what happens these three guys are always fighting all right the entrepreneur keeps figuring out new ways to do things which the manager has to achieve which means the technician has to keep retooling right so so the technician hates the manager because the manager makes him do stuff that that, that he doesn't want to do right manager hates the entrepreneur because the entrepreneur keeps as soon as the manager has something settled the entrepreneur has a new idea right oh wait a minute we can do this bit <laughs> right and and the technician entrepreneur cannot get along because they can't speak the same language right because the entrepreneur is always dreaming and the technician is always in, is talking about the present got it and when you are the got same it. person you got to allocate time to be a manager you got to allocate time to be a technician you got to allocate time to be the dreamer and i think that is part of a mental health right if you don't take out the time of being in the business and start working on the business right you'll never get out of that cycle that you're stuck in right now so, so you got to take some days off you, you know, some of my best ideas some of my best ideas have come on have come on travel trips it, it, it and they weren't like i had to go abroad they were they were trips to kulu manali they were trips to you know alibag just taking a few days off and getting out of the that that routine that you set for yourself so that you can start thinking of ideas that are in your head but are not getting time to be expressed and, and i think that's a very very important part of of the e myth the e myth is the book yeah michael gerber e myth mm-hmm. it was uh, that that's a great book it was in fact that was the book gifted to me by my uh, mentor's business partner when we took over the business and before you start here is a book you should read uh you can sell anything by joe girard uh is on sales i think how i raise myself from failure to success in selling is another great book uh, uh and then uh, there is a book uh, the four agreements i think this is the book i've written a blog on this uh, I've, this is the book i've gifted the most in my life i've gifted this book over a thousand times uh and uh, again a great book uh, by don miguel ruiz just you know simplifying life into saying there are four agreements you got to make with yourself and then or all, all, all the crap in your life uh, sort of disappears you know that's how you show me the money show me the money it's also your twitter <laughs> handle so yeah. guys write to me at show me the money it's a s h o w the money so the money yeah. is s h o s h o w m e m e yeah correct that's the twitter handle guys write to him there and thank you for being on the upstreamlife.com because i've covered uh, what anirudh his right i like i said uh, apart from being conservative you can also put in the accelerator and and you can go at 100 miles per hour or 200 miles per hour and yet stay frugal in many ways and you know this has been fascinating uh, i i think we can go on for a couple of more hours and i would want to continue this podcast i'm going to divide it into parts i think perhaps you have to take me on this offer perhaps we should pick in 10 of our favorite books and just talk those books yeah. right and yeah and, done i think great yeah? yeah and we should do a podcast around that absolutely yeah like yeah, like, yeah. i think the, another <laughs> book that i mentioned was how will you measure your life it's a great book for founders to read okay yeah yeah that's a great book too i would i think all of clayton christensen books are good right and uh, and and i i you know one one book i would want to i would want you to read because i because you've seen so much and you've traveled so much it's called, it's a book called uh, seven pillars of wisdom by t oh. t e lawrence you must have seen the movie the lawrence of arabia right Yeah, but the yeah, book, okay. but the book is so much more better simply because it talks about uh, the triumph of the will. The how when you're motivated to do something, uh, you will really push yourself. And like like you said, it's all about reporting that you record what you've done. You don't do it randomly. Yeah, and it's not gut feeling, right? But it's an interesting in- interesting thought process. Yeah, any athlete does that, right? How, how do they know they're getting better? Because right? you, yeah, you, you run faster than the last time, you lift more. Like so, we all do it. It's just the same, same, same. It's a very simple concept. Yeah, just bring it to your startup. That's it. That, that's great advice, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'll see you, Anirudh. Thank you, thank you, Vishal. Thank you, everybody. 